So welcome everybody, those of you who made it, well done. My internet connection is now unstable. <laughs> it's all fabulous. <laughs> um, I'm, as you can see from the screen, Victoria Priva, I'm the food editor of the Jewish Chronicle. And I'm really excited. I think everyone's really excited to be here tonight um, yeah. to, <laughs> yeah, to speak to um, Sarit Packer, Itamar Srilovich and Uri Buri Jeremias. Um, Sarit and Itamar are the husband and wife team behind the Honey, <laughs> hey, behind the Honey and Co brand, which includes Honey and Co restaurant, Honey and Smoke, and Honey and Spice Deli Cafe, um, which are all based in Fitzrovia. They've also got a wonderful series of food podcasts, which include interviews with celebrity chefs, and um, which were recorded live pre-pandemic, but have morphed into Zoom chats and uh, do some amazing things about their new book, which we'll be getting on to. Their new book is called um, Chasing Smoke, Cooking Fire Around the Levant. And we're going to be talking about that this evening. Um, that's their Most importantly, we, we are uh, super fans. Yes, we we're getting to that. He can't contain himself. He's so excited about, um, I was going to say, in the book, they visit Akko Acre in Israel. That's my link to our other wonderful guest, Uri Buri Jeremias. Um, Uri is the founder of Uri Buri Restaurant. He's a superstar. He um, also founded the Effendi Hotel. Um, he's a self-taught chef and has been at the helm of his very popular fish restaurant for 33 years, which is quite something to be at the top of your game at such a wonderful restaurant for all that time. He told me on Saturday when we spoke that um, his restaurant has been in the top 25 of the TripAdvisor restaurants, best of the best in the whole world uh, for several years. And he's currently number 19 in the world. Um, I'm just going to... <laughs> and I calculate, you I mean, know. for us, it's number one, but okay, whatever. Absolutely, absolutely. So welcome, Uri. Thank you very much. Um, and <laughs> it's Martin Sarit. Oh, yeah. very, very, very excited to see him tonight, and we'll get to that. I was just going to ask, um, Uri, how's the restaurant doing? Because I know there was a little bit of damage there back in May. How, how are you operating at the moment? We have now um, a new place, a pop-up uh, restaurant that we've built in an industrial area uh, in Akko in order to um, bridge the time until we have uh, finished the restoration and uh, renovation of the original restaurant. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, most of our clients and many other people that are coming to strengthen us are visiting us day by day and we are quite in a good uh, position there. Yes. And um, the most important thing for me was to keep my unbelievable team in the restaurant. I took all the people from the restaurant and the hotel and we are working together in order to uh, maintain all this. And, uh, you know, if you close the restaurant for a few months, then it falls apart. And uh, a chef without, without workers is worth nothing. So, I was going to say that, how, how all of you have done during the lockdown. We are coming back to this because I need to give these guys time to tell you how much they love you. But um, what we I, have, was going, <laughs> I was going to ask again after the lockdown how, how things have been for all of you. It's not easy. It, it is, it was, uh, it's almost two years now of uh, unbelievable uh, waves in the sea, as we say from uh, this point of view. And um, it was just, uh, you couldn't prepare for anything. You don't know how things will happen. And uh, one, um, one task was to stay together and uh, to keep on going and look forward uh, with the optimism. I say, uh, if someone is a pessimist all his life and reaches his last day, and uh, discovers that uh, he was wrong, he has um, fucked up a whole life. <laughs> if someone is an optimist all his life and comes to the last days and discovers that he was wrong, it is one day that he's lost. So uh, by definition, I'm an optimist. Uh, and um, this is the only way 
to um, prevail and uh, go on in, in circumstances like this with so many changes and unexpected uh, events and from all sides. Uh, so uh, I'm optimistic and I have all these people beside me. We will, we will do it. Yeah. And how about you guys? How are things in London now? I mean, I think you, you have to be optimistic to be in restaurants, don't you? You have to go to sleep knowing that whatever happened, it's going to somehow work out because, and this is, I'm sure Ori will agree with me, because there is something in this, like we thought we've been in this industry for 20 odd years. And like we work with uh, kids, we work with like 20 years old and they think we're so tough because we're like, we've seen everything, we've done everything, you know, everything. And it's true in, in, in a restaurant, everything that can go wrong does go wrong, you know. Especially this year. The drain, the fridges, the customers, everything goes wrong. So you think you're kind of like, okay, whatever. But then this, really? Yeah. <laughs> this, let's say none of us expected yeah, this last like year. Even, yeah. th this year and a half. And actually what I think it's done for us, and I think for a lot of people in the industry has made us think about our industry maybe slightly differently. To, um, to realize what's important for us, who are the people that are really important for us, how we get them to, to, to become a part of something bigger and how you protect people when there's not a lot of work happening and when you don't know um, like what tomorrow is gonna bring, when you don't know if you're gonna have customers tomorrow, when you don't know, you know, then the next day you have to open and everything's kind of okay. And then in two days you have to close again or, you know, all of these changes make you realize that kind of people are there with you for a fight. Like the, you know, the people that, that stick around become your family, your team. And, and then that gives you energy to be optimistic for another day. But it's not been an easy year or year and a half, I would say. I'm going to come back to that because there was a, a question I'm going to ask about your teams because I know both, both sides, of, it's really important to you. What I want to do is give you two the opportunity to tell me why Buri Buri is such a special place for you guys. That it's it's figured I'm in two start of your books. Showing you, the, Uri is, is already like in two of our books because the first in our first book. Wait, why don't can I bring the first book? You can bring the first book, yeah. but you have to be quick. Sorry. So in our first book, basically, Itamar and I I've got the first book. Yes. we met in a kitchen. Ah, she's got the book there. We met I've got the book. The, uh, <laughs> You know, we met in a kitchen, we started dating, we started uh, thinking about our life. Oh, we look, this is you, your restaurant and your famous <laughs> dish. So this is like a tribute actually to our first book. So this is in our latest book, but the whole point is a tribute to this first book because we... This is the first recipe in the first book because for us, this is where it began. And it's called Ori Buri. Yeah. yeah. Oribori prawns. Oribori prawns. Because for us, we, so we were chefs and we were eating everywhere in Israel. And I live kind of just outside, outside the Kareot and Akko is kind of where we would go out to the market to, to eat and to the beach and all of this stuff. So it was very familiar for me. And I was taking it out to show him my kind of part of the world, I suppose, because he's a Jerusalem boy. Um, and we were trying to think what we're going to do with our lives. And then we went to Uri's for a meal. Which we, we loved, you know. And the problem with going there is that you have to have the classics. But also you want everything else. But then else. you have to have everything else. So you always go, you need to have these prawns. You need to have the steamed aubergines. He took them off. So no. Last time I was there, they were not there. <sighs> aubergines with soya. I don't know if you remember. So, We've lived here for a while. But to me, your so aubergines good. with soya are like the best revelation, thing in the world. Revelation, revelation, revelation. There's no chance that I can go. And you have to have the sardines, the cured sardines. And you have to have the little falafel. And you have to have the bass porcini. So you have to have everything on the menu. And then it's like... Oh, and we also have on special la, 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 prawns la, with artichokes la, la. and lemon. So you have to like eat everything. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, we would go there and sit for like four hours and eat the entire menu. But anyway, this prawn dish was where we decided to move to the UK and to get married. To so get we, married. we got so, engaged there. Yeah. So for us, it's a big thing, your restaurant, Uri, and we're so excited. And we've kind of, you probably don't remember because you get a lot of people, but we have seen you over the years in the restaurant because you tend to be there quite a lot you know, walking around and always with the beard. And it's also given us this idea where even on days where we're not in the kitchens or stuff like that, just the walking around, being a presence in your restaurants is, is important. 
you know, it's important for the people eating and it's important for your staff because it's, it's what makes a place special where there's like a, a clear spirit behind it. And I think in our minds, you obviously have an extremely clear spirit that leads this kind of place. And in and your- you feel it. You know, you know and feel it. in your pop-up, which I had to miss because I had tickets to Israel that got canceled. So as soon as I booked tickets, just so you know, my family booked the biggest table in your pop-up so that I can come and eat. <laughs> and then my tickets got canceled. So they all went to eat and sent me pictures. And I was like, don't send me pictures of your lovely meal while I'm like stuck in London in COVID. Um, yeah. COVID. So let's, let's um, go to... I've had a, leave that, but that's it isn't it, it you, you proposed to her there and you made a big life decision well, no I proposed to her a few times <laughs> so I proposed to her four times I think before that but the first time she said yes was there yes. at Uribori. number five five lucky <laughs> yeah you know? yeah so I did I proposed many times the first time I proposed in Dr. Shakshuka <laughs> so I had to up my game you know <laughs> <laughs> but uh this is the first time that we that she said yes and this was the moment that changed our lives because we we went on a on our journey together and this is you know if my if our restaurant could be a fraction to someone what your restaurant has been for us then i would be happy i don't know more than happy this is what it's about it's about living these life moments about giving people the place to have these amazing life moments and it's more than food and it's more than service and it's more than it's just magic so tonight we are talking about food um <laughs> i was going <laughs> to, to ask you know <laughs> bring you back to the food i was going to ask about the hospitality side of things because i know for uri as well it's very important the whole package of hospitality i was going to ask what what would make someone want to visit again? I wonder if we'll go into some food, maybe come back to the, the thread about hospitality. One first question um, to, for everyone out there, the book is about the food of the Levant. Where would we describe the Levant as? Well, it's, it's very amorphous and all of these, these terms, you know, people say Middle East or MENA and it's not, it's really hard to define. I think we kind of took the eastern part of the Mediterranean, you know, where, where it's really hot, basically. Mm -hmm. That was kind of like our uh, measure for it. So it's a very amorphous stage. There's no legal definition for it. It is what you need it to be, maybe, yeah, or what we, you want we, it to we, be. In our minds, we kind of traveled this crescent that goes from like Turkey to Greece uh, through Israel. Greece to Turkey. Greece to Turkey, yeah. Israel, uh, <laughs> Jordan, and uh, Egypt, with the kind of idea that we would have filled in a few more countries along the way if we had time, but then pandemic hit. But kind of that's kind of our thing of looking at it as like this kind of half moon thing around an area that we call like our kind of swimming pool, I suppose. It's around the Mediterranean Sea. It's using a lot of the same ingredients, a lot of inspirations that we would get from like marketplaces all of this stuff and and i think it there's a big language that has developed in food in israel that respects that part i think Uriburi does that really well of like taking taking some you know touches of different things but not being shy with messing stuff around like we say one of the favorite dishes i had ever there is like aubergines and soya so there's not like a definition that you can say okay you only cook with olive oil and you only use garlic like it's it's about a lot of things, and that our book was the same. It's about a lot of things. So Uri, when you're thinking about food and putting dishes on your menu, how does that happen? Where, where, where does that? Where do you? Where, how, what's your process? There is no purpose. There is one thing. Uh, it is uh, mainly relying on my taste, and uh, I have never learned cooking. I never worked in any restaurant. I'm just a hobby cook and I'm still a hobby cook and I'm playing around with the raw materials, uh, simple ones. I'm not trying to bring any special uh, things from anywhere. 
I think we have enough ingredients and uh, different uh, ways of preparation. And uh, if we have in the lottery 40 something numbers and we have to choose six, you can have uh, millions of combinations, many millions of combinations. If you take the ingredients, we can play a lifetime, uh, 20 hours a day, and we haven't achieved to from, from uh, 200, 300 um, basic uh, um, materials to make all possible uh, combinations. So I'm playing with my own combinations, like a game, and uh, there are a few, I have, uh, principally I have no principles, but I have a few guiding lines. And uh, the guiding lines are, first of all, I will serve only things that I myself like to eat. The second thing is there is nothing in the plate which is not edible. And there is nothing in the plate which is not been, been, not uh, adding or contributing to the balance of the tastes. There is always one thing that is the issue, the main issue, like if it's a fish or whatever, or vegetables, if it's a vegetarian thing, and then what will support it? And a very important thing is I'm trying to work with no more than eight up to nine ingredients in one dish because I don't want to have the cacophony. I want to realize what I'm eating, to see, to recognize, and to taste. And I think this is a very basic kitchen. It's nothing that you can write songs about. Um, the only thing is uh, if we have balanced it properly. Another thing that I don't make is make mountains in the plate. You know, one day I saw a waiter coming and holding the fish with the fingers in the plate, asked him, why do you do this? He said, I don't want it to fall again. You know? <laughs> 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 and and uh, um, I'm doing with the best ingredients, the best I know. And if you like it, join the club. I'm not, uh, and, and another thing that I like is small dishes and more of them and not big dishes. And if someone says, we, we serve small and expensive things. I say, okay, I accept. I don't want to serve big and cheap things. It's not my, it's not my interest. I want people to come and eat special things that they don't usually or daily base eat. And this has to be something that um, we, we are offering a tasting menu, which is many small things to share. I think sharing is another uh, adventure in, in food, more than eating big, huge uh, lobsters or something, you know, that tastes from A to Z the same, have a variety of tastes that are coming from very different uh, angles of, um, uh, of materials and tastes. And um, that, that's all I do. I, I really try to do all these things that I like to eat, and uh, eventually there are enough people that enjoy it. The other thing is it's kind of a familiar base of, of uh, entertainment. Um, the waitresses are not taught to uh, try to sell more wine or something like this. Uh, they are there to um, build a tailored meal for each table uh, to reach one goal, and this is that the guests, once they go out after they have paid, will uh, think about when and with whom I want to be here next time. If this is achieved, the waiter did his job. Absolutely. Would you just that style? I'm going to ask you guys about meze style of eating, but that style of food. Would you? How do you eat at home? If you were creating a meal for your family, or does your wife? I don't know who cooks at home. Um, yeah. I cook and my wife bakes and my children and grandchildren and all the family, they are, uh, they love the food. So um, I have to, uh, to use the same basic rules while I'm cooking at home. And um, that's the only place I'm still uh, um, really working in the kitchen. So <laughs> in, the, in the restaurant, I'm just talking all the time. Who do you have favorite ingredients? Are there things you always go back to? Basically, I understand the fish, seafood, and algae. 
and I'm uh, busy with this mainly because um, I have uh, immediate uh, reach of the best uh, raw materials. And our area, the Western Galilee, is very rich with vegetables and fruits from all kinds. Uh, so um, this is what I'm based on today. We have uh, constantly, we are making new dishes for uh, vegetarians and vegans because it grows. And as I don't serve meat, uh, this is the uh, alternative. And um, we are doing it also with a, a no, no special, you know, um, you know, milk from, from soya or uh, other things like this. We are using the very normal materials that we have. And if we make a dish with the coconut milk and uh, chili and apples and fish, we make it now with the cauliflower uh, for the vegans and uh, they very much enjoy it. And the same with the Mediterranean fish uh, that we make with the olive oil, uh, coriander, garlic, uh, chili pepper, and lemon. Uh, we will make it with the, um, uh, with, veg with baked vegetables like um, uh, sweet uh, potatoes and, and um, asparagus and so on. And it's a um, fantastic veg uh, vegan uh, dish, you know. So um, we, we are trying to go simple, but it, all, it is all based on uh, the variety and the balance of tastes. Uh, that's it. And you guys, uh, sorry to interrupt, to, to ask these guys what they would also, um, cooking for guests, because we are thinking about that this evening in planning, pulling together food for. We so, are, we, we've, um, just be, we've just finished the shoot for, <laughs> we just finished the shoot for Rosh Hashanah because we were just talking about what, what we would make because you know we did we've been doing all these feasts over lockdown and stuff like that and then we took a bit of a break for summer because we were like okay it's summertime people can just cook themselves you know also we had the barbecue book out so we're like okay let's encourage the barbecue and leave the meal so now we we just started talking about what we would make and then Roche. Roche. Roche yeah. Yeah, and i'm sure everyone out there's going to be interested in that one but well, we, what do we? What did we make? We made. I made like a really beautiful fig salad, so a fig and red onion salad with sumac. Because figs just come into kind of season in the last two weeks of August, and then they run through September. So it's really lovely. The Turkish figs and uh, chicken cooked in pomegranates. Everything has got a sweet kind of. Everything has like a sweetness to it because it's Rosh Hashanah, and that's the point. So, you know. Yes, yeah, so a chicken cooked in pomegranate molasses and then a honey cake with whole apples in and an Which apple baklava. Which is buckler. amazing. Yeah. Like she, I can say we're, my wife cooks and bakes, but she bakes, she's an amazing baker. And we, she makes um, beautiful, beautiful honey cakes every year. That every year we say, oh yeah, we're going to make huge batches and just give to everyone, all of our stuff. And then we get to Rosh Hashanah and it's like, oh, we're, <laughs> we're like, we never get... <laughs> But this year, maybe. Maybe, maybe we'll get to it this uh, year. But and this year, she's poaching whole apples in saffron. She, the cat's oh. mother. Uh, <laughs> we're poaching whole apples in saffron and bake them into the honey cake. And it is so good. I can't tell you. Lovely. Uri, do you something, do something special for Rosh Hashanah in the restaurant around that time of year? Richard. Um... You know, uh, we're making always something that is just available, like if we have in the beginning of the uh, guava or, uh, or pomegranates, as I uh, said before, and uh, put them a little bit into our, our um, salads and so on. But uh, in general, our menu is very flexible because we always have some surprises from the sea or something I discovered in, in, in the market that I can make a small soup out of or something like this. It's very um, uh, mobile, you know, it's, uh, it changes all the time. Do you not make you filter fish? You filter fish. What? <laughs> no you filter fish. No you filter fish. No, but you know, in Israel, you don't have to like celebrate the holidays in the same way as you have to celebrate them when you're not in Israel, because when you're in in another country, then your way to connect to a holiday is by 
cooking the food of that holiday. But when you live in Israel, all you do is barbecue mm. and have like friends over, or you go to like a lovely restaurant and you eat beautiful food yeah. that Uri prepares or another amazing restaurant. So it's also, quite a different... I mean, I will say this, that in Israel, oh, can you hear the sirens? They're coming for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in Israel, you have a big major holiday every 45 minutes. There is something. So it's not as exciting. Not I so find. exciting. Yeah, here we do like, we do Rosh, we do Passover, we do, what's the that's other it. one? Maybe we make donuts for Hanukkah, but yeah. that's about it. But in Israel, you celebrate like Sukkot and then you and have, then, And you then know, there's yeah. like Rosh Hashanah Leila no, and then there's like Rosh Hashanah for other things. And then there's Rosh Hashanah for everything. And it's like, what holiday is it? I don't even know anymore. <laughs> So I, I would ah. edit, we curate. I, I'm adding in um, Rosh Hashanah just to uh, announce that we are aware of Rosh Hashanah. I give apple with, with the honey for the uh, start, you know, on the, on the, with the starters on the, on the base yeah. of the meal. And that's the main thing. The other things are changing according to whatever is on the... Uh, on the market these days. Or would you struggle with fish and what's happening with the, with the Mediterranean and being overfished? Is this something that the restaurant suffers from quite a lot? First of all, it's not the Mediterranean, it's the whole world. Yeah. I was in um, Eritrea. It is probably the only place in the world where fish are still dying in old age. All the rest of the uh, seas, uh, fish are not um, not really reaching uh, proper age, and uh, what what happens is that we have more and more we are using more and more uh, fish from agri uh, marine agriculture, not as a choice but as a fact of life, mm -hmm. and I think that this will grow, and uh, now we are. I'm starting uh, to play with the uh, seaweed, which is quite interesting. And um, I have a startup uh, with um, extracting uh, very interesting, um, very interesting materials uh, out of uh, algaes. And I think that uh, this is a kind of a future of what we will have from the sea, because like spirulina is growing, is doubling its uh, its uh, weight in uh, 42 hours and 48 hours. So it's uh, just unbelievable the potential in these things. But uh, this is still in the um, we have a few dishes that uh, are using algae, fresh, ah. and uh, this is this is rather new. This for the last two years that I'm. Playing with this in the kitchen. What do you do with the algae? We always used to make. Sorry. I'm making. I'm making a cookie Saint Jacques, the scallops, in um, very short on a plancha, and um, we put it on a puree of Jerusalem artichoke with fresh spirulina. Nice. And this is a very special dish. Must be a lovely color. As the color is. Uh, dark green of the, and the, the base is uh, the uh, um, white, uh, pale um, artichoke and uh, cookie Saint-Jacques. Very pretty. Now you've talked about La Plancha, the grill. Um, I wanted to talk you know, quite a bit about cooking on coal this evening because the book is all about the, uh, cooking on coal. The recipes can be made in the, ki in the kitchen, but, but um, all but I think four can be done both ways, but essentially it's uh, about cooking over coal. And you mentioned, sorry, to Nitama, that in Israel, everyone, bar was it Uri said, everyone barbecues. Um, but I'm interested to know then, then why, why you chose, maybe I've answered my question, but why you particularly chose a book about cooking over coal. And then to bo all, both all of you, how important it is as a cooking method. I mean, I was, sorry, do you want to? No, no. I was, like you know this is something that's so ingrained not in in our culture and us growing up you know if, if we have israelis in the audience we say mangal yeah this is what we do you go out barbecue we go mangal and you know like i said every 45 minutes there's a holiday what do you do mangal you or just on a saturday it's yeah just or on a saturday or something it? like that 
Uh, but only when I came here did I learn that it's a Turkish word. Yeah. Which I was, you know, was like, no, it's, it's I mean, I didn't know this. And, you know, of course, we love this type of food and we love these kind of Middle Eastern chagrul flavors. We love, you know, of course, not only Uri, but there's, you know, in Akko, there's so many kind of these fish grills. You know, some are good, some are not so good, but it is a very distinct kind of genre of restaurants. And, you know, in the Galilee, all the grill houses, these are the flavors that we love the most, you know. And we were kind of curious a little bit to, to learn a little bit more about where it came from, what are people doing, what is happening now, no, not in a historic sort of scholastic way, but just to go and see what people are cooking, you know, what's happening around. And to, to also see how it survived in a world that's kind of changing because everything's becoming more modern and all your cooking equipment, like when you go to like a trade show, if you're in, in the industry and you go to a trade show, there's like, cook things in you know put them in a bag and cv the bag and put it in water and it cooks it and there's all these like crazy machines that will tell you you know these ovens you can just set them you set them on a you know you put a there's a little picture of a salmon you can put a whole salmon in the oven put a picture and it comes out cooked like it's supposed to we just wanted to go back to like how people connect to the food it's very kind of primal cooking on fire cooking on a grill on a plancha any one of these things it's like about the the kind of the smell and the sizzle and the the, the the energy the look and all of these things are like we just kind of wanted to connect again into just the pleasure of cooking and simplicity i think because already talked about everything keeping things simple yeah. perhaps that fits in with your your theory you know your your way of, of cooking that the, the grill is the most simple yeah it is it's the kind of the the simple seasoning isn't it yeah mm -hmm. It gives you an instinct flavor and it's i think from that point of view we share an aspect of like respecting an ingredient and giving it a voice and not trying to overcomplicate a dish like what we were saying before not to put 300 ingredients and to pile them high or to make it's about a very kind of honest delicious always delicious that's always the you know the, the, the base of it all yeah. is it always delicious like if it's not delicious it shouldn't be not not in your home not in your restaurant not anywhere like there's no point why waste time on eating food that is you know processed or or not not good for you there, there's no part of the optimism is you need to enjoy all your meals as well <laughs> and enjoy good food is a big part of that I was going to, in fact, Uri mentioned when we spoke on Saturday that um, you smoke in another way. You talked about pine needles, I think. Yes, um, I'm, I'm a fan of cold smoke. And fish, uh, it, it will fall apart if you smoke it in uh, hot smoking. And so I just put it a little bit in um, salt, salty water, the fish. And then I... Uh, um, make the um, smoke, may I smoke it with the pine needles in a cold smoke. And this is a very tender, no bitter phase. Um, it's uh, for me, it's the best way to make it. We make like a bruschetta and we take uh, um, aubergines that we make, that we burn on open fire until it's really, the, the peel is really burned. And then we take a part of the peel and make a um, kind of a cream with only a little bit of, uh, of the um, sunflower oil and uh, a touch of salt. And we put it on a bruschetta and on top of this, this smoked fish and nigella. And uh, you can eat it. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting so hungry. I've just run from work. <laughs> Haven't had dinner yet. This is terrible for me, this conversation. You're welcome. It's I'm just like around the corner. <laughs> Like, the movie is still open. Yeah, who's, ma yeah, uh, who's making us dinner? Who's making us smoke to Uri <laughs> What is pine in Hebrew? Bosch? No, Oren. No, uh, Oren. Oh. Machatei Oren. Oren, yes. Machatim uh, Yeah. Oren, yeah. someone is asking us about staffing, and I'm kind of wondering if Israel is suffering from the same issue that, that we are what? here. Uh, you ah. know, finding chefs, finding waiters, finding people that want to work in the industry. Do you think Israel is 
suffering as well? Or, I mean, in London, it's definitely a Oh, problem. wow. Apart, apart um, quite apart of the, uh, the um, restaurants, coffee houses, bars that have closed in the lockdown, once they opened, they didn't have a team. They were all gone. Part of them didn't want to go to, back to work at all. And um, others had um, chosen uh, like to go and study or go down to a lot, God knows where, uh, in order to keep my uh, people together, my staff together. Uh, we all volunteered to cook for elderly people in Akko, lonely elder people, because of the lockdown, they couldn't go out to buy and so on. The city hall gave us the, number, the names of the people, the addresses and so on. And our kitchen staff uh, volunteered to uh, cook and the uh, waitresses brought us uh, into their homes. And we came out of the lockdown and all the team was there. We were all together and uh, you can't believe what an atmosphere and what, um, what it added to us, not to the old people, to us. And now once my restaurant was burned down, the first thing I did is Within uh, two weeks, I found another uh, um, replace place to build up the restaurant. And uh, within one week, the whole team brought it into uh, uh, fair conditions, I would say. Uh, okay. And our customers, our friends, our staff, they all stayed together. But in, in other places, it just fall apart. And you have to start from the beginning and you are two people who are working together. Myself, uh, if I had lost my team, I don't know, or I know I wouldn't start again, all over again. I wouldn't have the courage or the power to uh, start it all from A. And um, we have also a lot of young people, but uh, most of our team, like uh, Laura is 27 years with us, um, and, uh, you know, like we have uh, five people over 20 years and Ali, the chef, uh, who is a chef, uh, active chef now, he's 18 years with us and uh, the, another around 20 people that are more than uh, 10 years in, in the restaurant. So we have a very stable thing, but it falls apart. And once it's it, uh, closed for five months, uh, it is very hard to gather them again and uh, from different reasons. And this is all over Israel, a real, real problem. And you guys um, in London, how's it? Because I know you've also got a very strong team, people who've been with you a long time. How else? How I mean, we're not like Uli because we've only existed for nine years. We've just started our 10th year, but uh, we, we were very lucky to have a very strong management team that have all been with us, some from the very start and a few other ones joined kind of halfway through. But like, you know, so our kind of core management team has been with us for, for quite a few years and that was really important. And a bit like with Uli, we started back and open the first thing we did was come back and and cook a bit for the nhs and get you know to get food out of the kitchens just so the kitchens come back to life because like always saying you have to like get people back and working and it doesn't even matter what what you're doing really but kitchens have like a life and they need to to continue doing that you know if it's closed and it's shut like we went in to look I think we just went to check that everything, you know, freezers, fridges were working. And it was just so depressing yeah, that so first bad. month to, to after lockdown to walk in. And we were like, we can't do this. We don't want to do this. We want to reopen, start kind of cooking, start doing whatever. Whoever wants food will just like start doing it and just see how to get people back from home. Also, for a lot of reasons, you know, for their mental health and our mental health to not, you know, a lot of people in London... You know, Israel is a bit luckier because, especially in Akko, there's the sea, there's that, like in London, sometimes people are living in tiny apartments with a lot of shared flatmates and far, and from, if, their family, far from their families. A lot of times, a lot of, a lot of us are immigrants, like we are, a lot of our staff are immigrants. And unless they can come back to work, there's no reason for them to be in this city. There's no you know, if, if, if the, the, the cinemas aren't working and the restaurant scene is dead and there's no shows, like, what are, you, what are you in London for? So 
sadly, some people have gone back to their countries and we've had to replace a lot of staff and it's sad, but our core has been very, very strong. Mm -hmm. And it's been really important to stay open even in lockdown months for doing NHS or at home food or anything just to keep all of us um, sane, to keep us kind of working, to keep us enthusiastic. Yeah. It's, it's difficult, but it's, yeah. you know. And I will say this, I mean, there, there was never, and I'm sure you will agree with me, the staffing in the restaurant is a problem and has always been. It's always, there's, there was never a situation that we say, oh yeah, I have too many excellent chefs. <laughs> My waiters are too amazing. It's, it just, it's always been a problem. And the problem is that it's not, the problem is in the industry, you know, why would, you, you know, we need to pay better. We need to give people better hours. They need to be able to have families, period. Yeah. There's no two ways about it. If we don't change it within ourselves, there's not going to be an industry. We are so, we were so reliant on cheap labor from Europe. In Israel, it's always been, uh, you know, when I was working, it was uh, people coming from uh, Eastern Europe and then it was people coming from Ethiopia. It was always someone else. Thailand at some stage. Let's not, why should it be an industry of someone else? No, yeah. it should be that you should be Victoria, that your daughter, you'd be like, when she tells you I want to be a chef, you're not going to have a nosebleed. You're going to say she's going to have a wonderful career. I'd right? be delighted. <laughs> you, would be. Uh, you, you know, most people, look, but, but this is kind of what we, we're working towards, is yeah. to like understand that people uh, need a life work balance, but need to enjoy their jobs. There's a lot of things like we definitely don't believe in those kitchens that are very uh, angry kitchens, I, you know, we don't believe in the the shouting regimes and stuff like that it's just not what we want for ourselves and for the people that work with us yeah. i'm going to bring us back to food for our last 10 minutes i've had some questions here from two the first one um and feel free everyone out there if you want to ask a question i didn't mention at the beginning or maybe you missed me mentioning at some point and we'll, we'll take questions for our last 10 minutes dorit has said she'd love to get or oh, dorit had one one recipe from each of you um, an easy one that will wow our friends. I love both your restaurant in Israel and here in London. Thank you. So she's asking for a, a wow dish for the summer. So I'm sticking to my wow dish of fig salad. Yeah, I thought because that fig as well. salad is the best thing ever. This time of year, it's the best thing you can do. The eat. figs are just starting to come in. You can either get like the small green ones now, which are the first ones that come out, or then the bigger purple ones. You just slice them up. A bit of, we serve it always with goat's cheese and some gem lettuce, pistachios, a drizzle of honey on top. It's absolutely the best salad you can ever serve mint. anyone. Mint, mint and a bit of gem lettuce. There's a few things there. But people, they ask us, they like sit and they're like, is it fig season yet? Is the fig salad back on the menu? And honestly, sometimes I think, but it's the easiest thing. All it is is like a nice goat's cheese, nice figs, mint and pistachios, but mm. people just love it. So this is a dish to wow your... Yeah, Fabulous. Have one, one of our of our customers is a Saudi princess that she she comes and she cannot believe. What do you mean you don't have figs? We're like it's winter. We only <laughs> have them now, so we make sure that we keep some for her. And uh, she also buys fifty jars of fig yeah. jam a year. So I don't know how can you eat fifty jars of fig jam, but you can. One a week. Oh. Easily. Actually, I use figs in a recipe that will go in the JC over at over the Rosh Hashanah. It's a fig and pistachio frangipan cake. So I used instead of almonds, I used pistachios just for Beautiful. the colour and, 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 and the flavour. Full of lux. Yeah. Uri, do you have a, a wow recipe that you might want to give to Dorit? If you're talking about the salad, we have now the mango. Ah. Yeah. We make mango with the lemon and uh, some oil and peanuts and a lot of coriander, Ooh. fresh coriander mm. cut. Mm. And uh, this is just uh, so easy to make. It is a few minutes and you have an unbelievable salad. Oui, why did you take the aubergine off? Leave him alone. He's allowed the to have dishes in his restaurant. No, but the uh, we, have, we have to change once in a while. Uh, we have to change um, recipes. We have so many. And some recipes are there to stay because people are coming, especially for these dishes. And uh, I have to have them available all year round and all these years. Um, 
there are a lot of people asking about the aubergine salad. Well, tell but, us about the aubergine salad then. What, what, how's it cooked? What is it? Uh, no, it is, it is just uh, in um, Far East uh, style, but it has a balance of uh, um, soya and, uh, and um, rice vinegar. It's um, uh, white wine, sugar, ginger, and um, we just boil, boil it all together. And we can we can bake if you want it uh, not uh, not greasy not oily. We can bake the uh, aubergines in straps, and um, then just soak it into this um, uh, sauce. Leave it there for a few hours um, and serve it. And the other way is to fry the um, the aubergines and put it into the boiling um, sauce. And then the boiling sauce is releasing the uh, fat. And when you cool it down, the fat is gathering at the, at the top. You just take it off and you have a beautiful salad. It sounds wonderful, wonderful. Um, it's so tasty. But you know, you say Far Eastern, but for me it's, it doesn't taste like anything anywhere in the world except Uruguay to me. Yeah. You can add chili a little bit. You can add a little bit of uh, sesame oil uh, and so on. But this is this is over again. The simplest way is a beautiful combination. I've been asked: Are there any particular spices, maybe you know, spices that you use in Israel um, that are that lend themselves to cooking with coal or you know, summertime salads? Probably cooking over coal. Actually, they're spices that you prefer to use that are the best. I mean, you, you keep it simple. You keep it uh, like earthy spices, cumin, paprika, ground coriander. That's kind of the base, I would say, of everything. Quite a lot of uh, in, uh, allspice. You know, in, in Hebrew, it's called English pepper. Is it? Which is really strange yeah. because in England, it's hardly ever used as a spice, apart from maybe in pickling. But in Israel, we call it pilpil angli, so English pepper. And it's a really basic kind of spice in, in Egypt in a lot, in food. Palestinian food a lot, in Turkish in food. Galilee food. So it well. runs through that kind of region quite strongly and it gives a really like rich flavor. Subtle, yeah. yeah, it's it's quite an interesting one to, to kind of incorporate more. So sometimes called pimento or allspice. Yes, is like a few. So those would be like the bases. And then if you're kind of in the Galilee or if you're in Greece, you use a lot of herbs. So like wild oregano, rosemary, sage, anything like that with a bit of fire because they catch the smoke and it kind of imparts a, a smoke that has a lot of flavor to it. Um, so that's really... But do we count garlic as spice? Is no. garlic a spice? No, I wouldn't call it a spice because it's a flavoring, so I suppose. Because I love garlic on the grill and yeah. certainly we have one recipe in this book, in the in this book, that we serve for a long time in, in honey and smoke, of uh, confit garlic, so slow cooked in vegetable oil, and then we kind of smush it, so it's a garlic puree, and then you rub it on like chicken or fish or steak, and put it on the grill. I think it is the best, absolute best marinade there can be. It's a very nice marinade. It's really nice. The police are coming back for you. Yeah. They are. I've been asked by Dan Honey. Um, Honey? Are we related? <laughs> Dear cousin. A um, second cousin once removed. Um, <laughs> how do you cold smoke? That's probably to Uri because Uri talked about cold smoking. Yeah. I want to know as well. <laughs> yeah, we, we are doing a very, very simple uh, thing. We are taking a, a kind of a basin and uh, we put um, the fish on a, um, what do you call it, on a, on a grill, uh, and then we cover it with the, we light the, um, the uh, pine needles, we close it so the fire is uh, extinguished and we have only the glimmer, and then we open it shortly, put the fish in and close it again. And so it is, takes a minute of, re uh, covering of the fire and then extinguished again. It's 20 minutes 
and it's finished. It's a lot of smoke inside and you can make it with uh, no special equipment. Uh, it is just uh, very, very fast and very, uh, we, first of all, we put the, the fish into salt water, but it has to be thin, it has to be a filet of fish. It doesn't have, it can't be a full fish. And uh, we uh, debone it and uh, take the skin off and we put only the fish meat on, on the, on the uh, smoke. Amazing. Does it fall apart? You said it falls apart. Uh, the brining stops it fall, falling apart. When fish is, uh, is um, cold smoked, you can cut it, you can slice it into fine slices. And then you have a um, delicacy. And if you, uh, if it's burned, if, if it has, was in fire, you just try to lift it and it falls apart, you know, because of the heat. They like to, um, okay. like it's, it's cooked, you know. Yeah. Do you put it on something though, so that you can move it? On, on this like a mesh and position of Like a cooling rack, I assume. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe with a mesh or like a, yeah, like a cooling rack, not yeah. so fast. Yeah. I was going to ask this about yeah, what fish are like, yeah. oh, with just bars. You put yeah. it on top, yeah, on this, and you put it into the fire. This is all the, the all it needs, yeah. Yeah, we do that as well. We do that with duck breasts and uh, stuff like that. It's quite easy to cold smoke stuff. Like it's quite people shouldn't be so scared as long as you're willing to sacrifice one of your old kind of roasting trays because you it will burn a bit. That's yeah. all. That's all, you know, we, um, it's, it's just basic. And, and uh, I'll be doing I can send you a picture, uh, <laughs> yeah. you a picture. I just, uh, don't. let me have your email. No, send us the food, not the pictures. No, not the, the I don't want the picture. <laughs> I don't want the picture. <laughs> no one's cooking a dinner. Not, no, I, all I'm thinking <laughs> is, is if I was uh, a little bit older and I lived in Akko, I would have you delivering food for me during lockdown. I would be <laughs> <laughs> This is, I feel like so the jealous. Best, yeah, the best, uh... They would get like tasting menus, you know? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to make deliveries because uh, I, um, I believe that uh, fish has to be eaten on the spot. Yeah. It is impossible to make deliveries by once it arrives at home. And I don't like all this uh, plastic and, 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 and yeah. cardboard Pecs and I don't know. It doesn't taste the same. Never. No. So what did you do? What did you send them? We didn't do. We we volunteered and worked for the old <laughs> people. And yeah, but what did the old people eat? Did you make them like meatballs? What did they eat? No, we made them. We made, we made all kinds of food. We made fish and salads and soups and so on. But it was delivered within Akko, and they took it. We had many people, so they could go to three, four places at a time. And um, it was, it was uh, not, uh, I would say it was excellent food, but it was not so sensitive like fish. You make meatballs, you make a soup, you make um, minestrone, and you make it very rich. And you make an, uh, beside it some uh, meatballs in, in tomato sauce with rice or noodles or something else. It is all in good quality of materials and spiced properly without exaggerating and so on. And by the way, I, I'm, I'm using, we were talking about spicing. Mm. I'm using in fish a lot of, uh, in, in, in many cases, I'm using the anchovies as a spice mm. uh, instead of salt, which gives it a little bit of uh, more sea taste and um, so on like lemon. Uh, anchovy and olive oil, if you mix it together and you put garlic or chili or whatever, coriander, mint, it will always have a kind of, a, it will contribute to, to the um, story. So you whatever. smash the, uh, the anchovy into the oil, like you smush it? No, no you take the anchovy and you, and you uh, uh, blend it with the, um, whatever you want. You can blend it with olive oil, and then you have this liquid, which is uh, olive oil, which is uh, salty and uh, sea taste. You know, delicious. Ooh. And you can prepare. You can prepare a bottle, 
and then you can put it into the pan and put a little bit of garlic or a little bit of lemon or whatever. And uh, this is trying to kill us. What are hungry. you doing to us? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? Yeah. yeah. Would that no, just go on fish? But there's a good anchovy, uh, or tez, or something like this, you know, good anchovies. Yeah. Anchovy itself, I don't like. I can't eat anchovy. I don't like the pizza anchovy or anything like this because it's too strong. It takes over all, all the spices. But um, the most um, uh, interesting spices are the ones that you can use in a measure, even sugar or anything else. You know, say, people say sugar is not healthy, salt is not healthy, this or that. It doesn't matter if you if you balance it and if you have it in in a right uh, proportion, it will uh, show its uh, most beautiful sides and tasty sides, and uh, it will not um, overpower other things. Like uh, you have this uh, rose ice cream, for example. I'm making I'm making it with the sour cream, and rose ice cream with a uh, rose with uh, uh, sour cream breaks the sweetness of the roses, uh, rose uh, marmalade and so on. Mm. Uh, very one uh, track uh, taste. Uh, so it, 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 this is a game. Uh, uh, all, all cooking is a game. And uh, if, you, if you play it your own way and not, uh, and not you know, doing what you learned somewhere, then uh, I have attention disorder, so I never learned anything. I never worked in uh, someone's kitchen. And um, I just started as a hobby cook. And I went on because my friends uh, said, you can't uh, do this uh, to be so selfish and do it only for yourself. So you have to <laughs> share the love. Share the love. I'm going to butt in because Uri told me that even with the attention disorder, and I need to ask some more food questions, but I have to digress that he's just produced a book in the last year, um, a cookery book, which has won awards in Germany. It's in German, so um, most of us won't be able to, to read it, but he dictated the book to a German uh, food writer who has transcribed it, and it's won awards there, so I'm hoping we're going to see that in English. But, oh, but it, your also, book is in English. Your book came out in English. It's a new book. I have one book in English. No, the previous it, one also in English. I have the previous one in English and in Hebrew. Hebrew yeah. version is uh, sold out, and I wrote by request of Grefe uh, und is a German uh, publisher. Um, he ordered the book, they ordered the book. So I uh, speak fluent German, and um, but I'm not very well, writing and reading is a little bit slow in any language. So I just um, used a friend that uh, helped me to translate it into, uh, uh, you know, modern German. And, it's amazing. <laughs> and it was published at, uh, yeah, we have now within, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, published in um, October, 7th of October. And we have only uh, already the third edition. Amazing. And it won the, as the best um, cookbook in German of this year. Amazing. Oh, wow. Fantastic, isn't it? Well, Great. Well, I think this is worth learning German for. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> someone has to translate the book. Surely someone has well, to. It will be translated. I'm, I'm, uh, I, have the tra I have only the rights to translate it into Hebrew, but I guess that the Gref uh, Tunza will be uh, translating it to uh, more languages, I hope, anyhow. Okay, so I'm but, going to... Uh, your first book is amazing. Mm -hmm. It, it, that, it did came out in English. Yes, that one did. It's this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I bought, we bought it for our head chef, who is also a big fan of yours. Mm -hmm. uh, and we bought it so much to so many people. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. fantastic. It's out of print now, I think. You know, so there was a reason we couldn't, I think you told me I wouldn't be able to get it or maybe not. No, it, is, it is only, it is, we, sell up, we sell it only in the, in the uh, restaurant. It's the only place we don't have it on, uh, on uh, what's it called, uh, Amazon. Oh, uh, okay. The German, the German book goes in Amazon, and I think I should uh, sell the um, English book in Amazon because there's quite a lot of interest. Yeah. I'm going to ask a few questions or we won't get through them. I don't want to hold everyone up 
for the whole evening because I need to eat, they need to eat. Um, and maybe people at home need to eat. Lauren in Manchester has asked if you would ever bring out a gluten-free baking book. I think that must be for Sarit. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it because I've gone gluten-free, so. Ah, that's why she's asking, uh -huh. It will happen at some stage, not immediately, because I need to like work on it, but yeah. Sadly, okay. yeah, I've had to go gluten-free myself. So even though I love bread, but I suppose you have to find different oh, solutions. Hard, really hard. Um, I've been asked if you could choose one pudding right now to <laughs> eat. <laughs> what would you each of you have? What would you pick? So here you go. Pudding. You're choosing a dessert, a sweet to eat right now. What would be your favorite thing? Maybe you don't like I, ever, ever since we said uh, about the rose ice cream, which no, I you're had. thinking about rose Last ice time cream. we came, we had the rose ice cream and the knafe toys. Oh. And it was amazing. And ever since you said rose ice cream, this is the only thing I can think about. I'm but thinking, now I don't I don't think about the bruschetta anymore. So no, I'm good. thinking about mangoes. I know he I know we was talking about them as a salad, but I, you know, like if I could get like a proper mango that actually tastes like not like the stuff you get here, but like a proper delicious mango, but yeah. still a bit warm from the sun. This oh, is all right now. Real mango. Yeah. yeah, we don't see many here. No. Um, I'm going to wrap up in what's the time now? I'll give it five minutes and then or just uh, maybe a couple of minutes because I don't want to stop, but I'm aware that we uh, have run over. Ah, oh, look, oh, like not fair. Not fair. Not fair. Like, yeah. this is a, a talk that is like for us as well. Yeah. I've been upstaged by a mango. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we all we all were. We all were. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Upstaged by a mango. Yeah, it's, uh, really? you know, and it's not any I, mango. I keep, I keep tons of mango in my fridge every day. This oh. is this is the tone, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. See, that's so unfair. But I love it when you eat a mango and it's so delicious that the juice just pours down your face. It's unbelievable. First case I eat mangoes, Israel. One of the most amazing uh, um, fruits. And uh, the Maya is uh, really... It's a good one. Yeah, fantastic. Look, I'll, I'll show you what I was snacking on. This is a sad excuse. This is dry mango, but this is as good as it gets for us in the UK at the moment. Dry, <laughs> leathery mango. No, it's not the same. Not the same. No. no. We, we are drying uh, watermelons. And we Ooh. roll the watermelon uh, really? when it's dry and like leather. Oh, wow. We oh, roll, wow. Uh, we roll um, um, Lebanese cheese with olive, black olives, uh, Kalamata. Yum. In it, and then we we uh, put a little bit of uh, olive oil and basil, and a touch of um, of uh, vinegar. And what's it called? I'm um, sweet uh, vinegar. It's not uh, like a sherry. Oh, summer. Yeah. Oh. It's it's uh, and and the touch and uh, it's you know it's only very small. It's a very small uh, piece. Sounds delicious. But this is to change the taste in between. Um, the, in between the dishes. It's fantastic. Okay, I'm going to give two questions. Linda has asked a couple of times whether you would ever consider Honey's doing a kosher pop-up or restaurant at all, ever. Uh, look, look the, there's the one serious issue with the kosher food is that it's so expensive. And I, you know what, I need to sell a main course for 40, 50 pounds. I'm never going to do that. No, I think it's not just that. It's the fact that you have to let people into your kitchen to decide for you what is, you know, to go actual yeah. kosher. You have to let someone into your kitchen to tell you what to do and how to do it. Yeah. And that's not exactly how we see our, uh, yeah. <laughs> our, our kind of work no, in our industry. And only one boss. In I get that. And then my last question will be, um, each of you to give me your five favorite ingredients, and then we're going to say nighty night. But five favorite ingredients. Well, that's not. Should we make it three? Because <laughs> five could take some time. <laughs> no, I'm going to be very fast. Almond, oh. almonds, lemons, olive oil, garlic, and tahini. Nice tahini. Can't live without tahini. Uri. Well, uh, fish. See, uh, seafood in general, yep. and uh, I have to uh, add the garlic as well because I think it's uh, a very uh, powerful and uh, life-changing 
material and very healthy. Um, I would say coriander. Mm -hmm. I like fresh, fresh coriander. I like very much. And I have to be careful not to put too much of it because uh, I'm really fond of it. No such thing. And um, lemon is uh, very important. And I would say maybe um, salt, a good sea salt, like uh, bread, simple with butter, good butter and, and sea salt. I can really enjoy very much. Oh, me too. Right. Well, it's it's not chocolate, people. You're forgetting chocolate. It's true. It's about just choosing chocolate. Nothing else but chocolate. <laughs> High five. <laughs> My whole page next week is chocolate. Wall to wall chocolate. For, for us, for us, food for me, food without chocolate is like free from category. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't have chocolate then there is there are, are chocolates like fish you know and uh yes chocolate sardines <laughs> absolutely right i'm going to cut you all short um i hate to do this because i've had such a lovely time i apologize to everyone who couldn't get in initially but thank you both thank you uri itamar sari it's been wonderful hearing about everything people should it's rush out and buy the book life. and people should rush out and buy uri's book with a uh, German dictionary <laughs> but um, to everyone out there thank you so much for coming this evening and um, I think we need to ask Judah who's going to do the wrapping up but um, he will now wrap up the comment unless there's anything else anyone wants to say yeah I just want to say the, there was a comment here if we can do it uh, once a week I would love nothing more. This is what I want to do yeah, but we want to do it in person we want to yeah. go to Israel we want to come to always restaurant and to eat again and just all these memories and for us like honestly we're massive fans and this has been it's such been a pleasure such a us. pleasure and such an honor you're such a beautiful person and it's it's just humbling so uh, what do what do i have to say i was uh, flattered all this evening and i uh, i i have my wife she read it all <laughs> and maybe you change your mind in some way <laughs> And she'll be appreciate you want just to write, we can write you a letter of recommendation. No, I, I want I want her to see me in your eyes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't complain. Thank Thanks, God. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. I can't wait to go to Uri's in Israel and see you guys. I'm thank here, you. Here, and I I can't wait to call you to you to your restaurant. We have uh yeah. yeah, El and me, we have a um, girl that grew up in our house. She's in London. So she, we will come and visit and visit her when it's uh, open again for travels. And uh, we'll visit you as well. We it will be we the will, honor of our life. Yes. We really. will feed you more than, soon. More than you can. We will help in one piece. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. And um, I'm going to ask him to close, close the, the chat now. But thank you. It's been wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Thank Push the button.